31st, 1944, a 90-year-old man with an old-fashioned high collar and gold-rimmed spectacles gave a speech on the steps of the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Representatives of the toiling wealth producers have been denied. We have come through toil and weary marches to lay out our grievances at the doors of the national legislature and ask that they should heed the voice of despair and distress that is now coming up from every section of our country. That they should... Despite his age, Jacob Coxey spoke with authority in his voice and a glint in his eye. Most of the people in the small crowd that had gathered around him had no idea that it had taken him 50 years to make that speech. In the spring of 1894, Jacob Sickler Coxey led a march of unemployed men from his home in Maslin, Ohio, to the nation's capital. For five weeks, daily dispatches from the nation's leading newspapers kept readers transfixed with tales of the 400-mile trek to deliver a jobs petition to Congress. In later years, Coxey would recall that his march had humble origins. Back in 1891, I had a stone quarry a few miles north of Massillon, and I had to drive back and forth to town. That winter had been very wet, and the roads were so muddy that my buggy kept getting stuck. And all the time I was driving in, I'd see men tramping by, looking for work. Well, it just didn't seem good sense. There were all, all these, these men who needed work, and here were roads needing fixing. The logical thing was for the government to get them together, but the problem was to pay them. When I got home, I sat down and wrote out my plan. The main component of Jacob Coxey's plan was for the federal government to appropriate $500 million to put the unemployed to work building good roads across the country. In the summer of 1893, the 39-year-old Coxey took this proposal to a meeting of economic reformers being held in Chicago in conjunction with a magnificent World's Fair known as the Columbian Exposition. Passengers atop the world's first Ferris wheel could look out over a great expanse of the shimmering city. But at the edges of that city were thousands of unemployed people living in slums. National leaders had tried to downplay the country's growing economic woes, but the problem soon became too great to ignore. That same summer, a panic on Wall Street caused the stock market to collapse, a disaster that led to the closing of 500 banks, 15,000 businesses, and 74 railroads. Despite this national depression, which would go on for four more years, President Grover Cleveland held firm to a campaign pledge that the federal government would not provide welfare for its citizens. The lesson must be taught that while the people should patriotically and cheerfully support their government, its functions do not include the support of the people. The unassuming Jacob Coxey didn't have much success in finding supporters for his good roads idea. That is, not until he met a dramatic speaker from California named Carl Brown. I'd been commissioned by San Francisco Business Weekly to go to the World's Fair. As an artist and correspondent, at, at the same time, was provided with a fine suit a la Buffalo Bill to be a part of an exhibit on the wild and woolly West. 
The 44-year-old Brown was also a labor agitator whose fiery debating style and outrageous outfit attracted much attention at public meetings. After seeing Carl Brown in action, Jacob Coxey realized he had found the missing piece for his Good Roads puzzle, a publicist. Over the course of the next five months, Coxey and Brown had several meetings in Maslin to plan a promotional campaign. From outward appearances, Jacob Coxey and Carl Brown were an unlikely pair of collaborators. The nondescript, conservatively dressed Ohio businessman stood in sharp contrast to the flamboyant showman from California. The owner of a successful quarry business and a horse ranch, Coxey's personal worth was estimated at a quarter of a million dollars. The energetic Brown was a part-time printer, painter, cattle rancher, cartoonist, politician, and journalist. But his most striking talent was as an illustrated lecturer, holding audiences in rapt attention as he spoke for hours on economic issues in front of crudely drawn canvases. What the two men shared was a passionate belief that a radical action was needed to save the economy. With a plan in hand, they proceeded to organize the strangest publicity stunt the country had ever seen. On the evening of February 18, 1894, Robert Skinner, editor of the Maslin Independent, sent an unusual dispatch over the Associated Press wire. Maslin businessman Jacob S. Coxey is sponsoring a march of unemployed men to Washington, D.C. in order to deliver his Good Roads bill to the Congress. Coxey himself will give a speech from the Capitol steps in support of the bill. This bizarre story grabbed the fancy of news editors all over the country, and 43 reporters were dispatched to Maslin to get the inside scoop. Chief Marshal Carl Brown was the picture of confidence as he bragged to the young correspondents. We shall start the march with 5,000 men, and before we have gone 100 miles, we shall have an army of 10,000. The reporters didn't quite know how to take Carl Brown, but he certainly made good copy. Brown affects the cowboy's style of dress to the extent of a disgustingly filthy leather suit set off by high boots and a sombrero. Early and proper educational training might have made of Brown a man of more than ordinary ability, for he is a thinker of some force and possessed of a fair degree of intelligence. Marshal Brown immediately set up a tight organizational structure for the marchers. Discipline was enforced by a strict but popular character who was introduced to the press as the great unknown. The unknown is a man of great importance. His face and manner are refined and his clothing is fashionable in the extreme. Stranger still was Carl Brown's announcement that the procession was to be known as the common wheel of Christ. Brown's injection of religion into the Good Roads March had its roots in the death of his wife two years earlier. Just before death came to my wife, as I was sitting by her side, I, I realized with the quickness of a flash of lightning that I was absorbing her soul into my own. Do you not see anything singular in the coming together of Brother Coxey and myself? Well, I believe that the soul of Jesus Christ has been fully reincarnated in us and in thousands of people throughout the United States today. And that accounts for the tremendous response to this call of ours, to try and bring peace and plenty, to take the place of panic and poverty. That is why we start out on this mission on Easter Sunday, for He hath risen.
overcast skies and chilly weather reflected the mood of the country as the common wheel of Christ left Maslin that Easter Sunday morning, March 25th, 1894. A proud marcher held the symbol of the common wheel high as he led the procession out of town. Then came Jasper Johnson of Buchanan, West Virginia, one of Coxey's earliest recruits carrying the American flag. Next came Marshal Carl Brown and the great unknown riding prized horses from the Coxey Ranch. Behind them came the six-piece Commonwealth Band under the direction of Canton's J.J. Thayer. Then came the carriage of Good Roads Association President Jacob Coxey, followed by a vehicle carrying his wife and infant son, named Legal Tender. Young Legal Tender and his mother would leave the procession at the end of town and rejoin the troops in Washington. Elsewhere in the crowd were the other colorful characters who became household names thanks to the extensive press coverage. There was Christopher Columbus Jones, an imposing bearded leader of the contingent of Coxieites from Pennsylvania. Windy Oliver, the bugler. Cyclone Kirkland, the astrologer. Weary Bill, who served as commissary officer. And Oklahoma Sam, a cowboy from Coxie's ranch. The 122 people who left Maslin that blustery morning were far less than the 5,000 marchers predicted by Carl Brown. But other contingents of unemployed men were forming around the country. Within days, other marchers were on the road from Oregon, California, Colorado, Illinois, and Pennsylvania. Eventually, upwards of 10,000 men were making their way to Washington, D.C. The dozens of reporters who traveled with these men turned the event into the first media circus in the history of modern journalism. Although there was no formal coordination between the various marching units, the press lumped them all together as Coxey's army. They were 100 of the toughest looking bums that ever graced a station house or a boxcar. They had enlisted, attracted by the adventure the movement promised, with the prospect of three regular meals a day and no work required. Over the course of the first week of the march, most of the freeloaders dropped out, their numbers being replaced along the way by sincere working men who had been laid off. The common wheel traveled 15 miles each day, starting off at about 10.30 in the morning and continuing until a predetermined destination was reached in the late afternoon. Upon arrival in a particular town, the marchers would form a circle which kept spectators away while a sleeping tent was erected. That evening, a public meeting was usually held outdoors or in a local hall. After a program of songs written by the multi-talented Carl Brown, the Commonweal leaders described the Coxie plan to attentive audiences. After the Congress passes these bills, they will bring immediate relief to the unemployed by making public improvements and making it an impossibility for a man to seek work without finding it. Once an audience had been warmed up, Carl Brown took center stage. One observer described Brown's presentation as a strange mix of prophecy and politics, of theology and finance. 
My friends, we are fast undermining the structure of monopoly in the hearts of the people. Like Cyrus of old, we are fast tunneling under the boodlers Euphrates and will soon be able to march under the walls of the second Babylon. The infernal blood-sucking bank system will be overthrown for the handwriting is on the wall. Although Carl Brown's theatrics inspired a sense of awe in many of the common wheelers at the beginning of the march, after a few weeks, he was quietly referred to as Old Greasy, a nickname inspired by his shiny leather coat. Reporters spent a great deal of time talking with the marchers, searching for little bits of color to wire back to their gossip-hungry editors. I joined Mr. Coxie at Maslin because starvation was staring me in the face. For nearly a year, there hasn't been more than one day of work a week. My wife and child are presently taking relief uh, from the county. I joined this movement because I want to stir up the government to relieve in the condition of the working man. Something will have to be done, for we cannot put in another year like last year. I was on the hog when the circus started, and since they was furnishing grub, I joined. I, I don't know nothing about Coxie's bills or old Greasy's religious stuff, <laughs> but I'm having a whale of a time with the outfit. As the march continued through Pennsylvania and into Maryland, it became apparent that Coxie's army might actually succeed in reaching Washington. Weekly magazines fueled national worries about the Commonwealth. Some feared them to be violent revolutionaries. Others characterized them as dangerous tramps. One public health official called them an unwashed army that was carrying a plague of contagious diseases with it. At this point, a frustrated Carl Brown lashed out at the press corps. All you do is write us up as dirty tramps. Your sole purpose is to throw discredit upon this great movement. Why, you're nothing but a bunch of argus-eyed demons of hell. The reporters were amused by this melodramatic outburst and immediately organized themselves into a private club called the argus Eye Demons of Hell, or AEDH for short. As the march progressed, they issued badges and elected officers. Upon reaching Cumberland, Maryland, Marshal Brown convinced President Coxey to charter a couple of canal boats and make up for time lost during the trek through Pennsylvania's Allegheny Mountains. Christening one boat Good Roads and the other J.S. Coxey, the marchers got a chance to rest their feet as they floated their way towards Hagerstown. Following closely behind was a third boat full of reporters, which had been christened the Flying Demon. A smiling Carl Brown shouted a greeting to his journalistic adversaries. <laughs> I salute the Argus-eyed demons of hell. On Sunday, April 29th, the Commonweal of Christ reached Brightwood Park, a campsite just outside of Washington. Over the next few days, Jacob Coxey was able to obtain a parade permit, but was denied permission to speak on the Capitol steps. On May 1st, 1894, the final leg of the march began at 10.15 a.m. with about 400 men. Attention! Shoulder! Peace! Forward! March! Oh, 
several mounted policemen led the procession. A new addition to the common wheel was the radiant Mamie Coxie, riding a white Arabian stallion as the goddess of peace. Mamie was Jacob Coxie's daughter by his first marriage, and she sported a white riding habit topped by a red, white, and blue cap, emblazoned with the word free in silver letters. Behind the goddess of peace rode her secret admirer, Carl Brown. She was then 17 years of age, with a cameo complexion, starlit eyes, and peculiarly iridescent golden hair, loosely flowing in the wind. And I thought that she was the most beautiful sight I had ever beheld. But there was no time for artistic dreaming. Although one wire report suggested President Grover Cleveland was nervous, he was presiding over a cabinet meeting trying to keep up appearances as the army passed on a block away. When the marchers reached the capital at 1 p.m., they found their path blocked by a contingent of unmounted police standing with clubs drawn. Common wheel! Brown and Jacob Coxey dismounted and worked their way through the crowd of spectators looking for a way onto the Capitol grounds. Acting on an impulse, Brown and Coxey suddenly jumped over a low wall and headed for the front steps. Two mounted officers quickly followed them, trampling small trees and bushes along the way. Coxey easily blended into the crowd and was lost prompting the police to pursue the highly visible Brown. Several officers finally brought the elusive marshal down as their civilizing clubs beat this man of the frontier to the ground. I am an American citizen. I, I stand on my constitutional rights. Amid the confusion, other nervous officers started chasing innocent bystanders in the crowd, randomly striking men, women, and children with their clubs. In the meantime, Coxey had managed to reach the tenth step of the Capitol building before he was recognized and hustled back down by the police. As Coxey was escorted back to his carriage, a crowd of 10,000 people followed. When they reached the front of the procession on B Street, someone started to cheer. Coxie! 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 Gradually, Coxie, thousands Coxie, of voices joined in. Coxie! 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 A week later, Jacob S. Coxey, Carl Brown, and friend and follower Christopher Columbus Jones were sentenced to 20 days in jail for carrying illegal banners onto the grounds of the Capitol and fined five dollars for walking on the grass. After serving their time in jail, Coxey and Brown went back to the followers who had waited patiently in a new camp at Bladensburg, Maryland and made plans for one more march on Washington. On the 4th of July, a contingent of several hundred common wheelers, including stragglers from the western states, stage a salute to liberty in front of the Capitol building. This time, the procession was led by the common wheel's new goddess of liberty, resplendent in red, white, and blue bunting. This goddess wasn't quite as attractive as Mamie Coxey, but she looked vaguely familiar nonetheless. Even though he shaved, some of the marchers thought Carl Brown never looked better. In 1895, Carl Brown and Mamie Coxey were married and later had a son before eventually splitting up. Brown spent the rest of his life promoting various radical ideas. In 1914, during the course of demonstrating an eight-engined flying machine in Washington, Carl Brown died of an apparent heart attack. During the course of his long life, J. 
Jacob Seckler Coxey ran for public office 11 times. His only success was in 1931, when he was elected mayor of Maslin for one stormy term. During his last years, Coxey supported himself through the sales of homemade medical products, such as Coxylax, a mild laxative, and electric heels, which were metallic shoe inserts that supposedly inhibited arthritis. He claimed that his own longevity was due to his regular use of these products. Coxey died in his home in 1951 at the age of 97. He had lived to see his ideas about public works programs adopted by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Coxey had also lived to see many other marches on Washington by other citizens carrying their protests to the government. He even made a couple of other attempts himself. But it wasn't until the 50th anniversary of the original march that he was finally allowed to deliver his speech. We, the representatives of the toiling wealth producers, have been denied. We have come through toil and weary marches to lay out our grievances at the doors of the national legislature and ask that they should heed the voice of despair and distress that is now coming up from every section of our country, that they should consider the conditions of the starving unemployed of our land and enact such laws as will give them employment, bring happier conditions to the people, and a smile of contentment to our citizens. Thank you.